Oh. Alright, good afternoon. My name is Tor Moore. And my project was the possibility of brainwashing. Alright, so brainwashing, uh, the overall question was is, is brainwashing possible? Um, so for the uh, presentation, we're looking at a few brainwashing cases. And the overall question, aside from is brainwashing possible, is why do people think the way they do? Um, which is a power of persuasion, and then there's a difference between word choice, which I'll explain that there. So I chose brainwashing because I was really interested, interested in do as if people can actually persuade or change somebody else's actual opinion through brainwashing or just through persuasion. Um, this relates to chapters 2, 6, and 9 in the Griggs, in the Griggs textbook. Chapter 2 is brain processes in the cerebral cortex, which is decision making and cognitive thinking. Chapter 6 is intelligent thinking, um, why people think the way they do, and then how they rationalize their decisions. And then chapter 9 was how behavior is influenced by others, such as why we obey and why we conform to other people's um, demands. So first off, for the uh, yes, it is possible sides, uh, Trudy Solomon asks, what can persuade people to radically change their beliefs? Uh, she looked at uh, religious groups and religious cults in America and how they persuade youth to actually join those cults, even though they have such radical ways. Uh, she, she identifies three major techniques, which were isolation, group pressures, and coercion. Isolation is when you take an individual and remove them from their normal setting and isolate them from the, their normal environment. Uh, group pressures is when you take the individual, after they're isolated, you put them in with a group that's already conforming to the guidelines of the cult or the religious group. And then coercion is the act of compelling by force or authority. And then there's a YouTube video. But when an experiment is not a public opinion poll, it examines behavior under the pressure of social forces, as the experiment of Solomon Ash reveals. The experiment you'll be taking part in today involves the perception of lengths of lines. As you can see here, I have a number of cards, and on each card there are several lines. Your task is a very simple one. You're to look at the line on the left and determine which of the three lines on the right is equal to it in length. All right, we'll proceed in this order. You'll give your answer. Only one of the people in the group is a real subject, a fifth person with a white t-shirt. The others are confederates of the experimenter and have been told to give wrong answers on some of the trials. The experiment begins uneventfully as subjects give their judgments. Two, 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 two. two. the evidence of his own eyes and yields to group influence. What? Ash found sub subjects went a lot. Right, so what that experiment was showing was that even though the individual thought uh, line three was longer, and it was obviously was, because he was isolated and he was with a group of people that were conforming to the experiment, he went, he went along and said what they were saying even though he knew it was wrong. So that's kind of an act of brainwashing. Um, Merlu uh, was a medical doctor and he uh, explores the concepts of thought processes of prisoners of war. Uh, he actually interviewed several prisoners of war uh, during the Vietnam uh, communist eras. And his overall question, why do people vow to never surrender, but then eventually give in the pressure of the enemy? And he uh, related this to the innate ambivalence of all feelings, which is the natural conflicting feelings of both positive and negative connections towards something or someone. So he's saying that even though the prisoners vowed to never like give up information or tell the uh, their captors what they wanted to hear, because it was a life or death situation, they eventually gave in to save their own life. Uh, he he uh, also explores three different uh, tactics for brainwashing: media persuasion, raising internal conflict, and survival, which overrides dignity. The last one, survival overriding dignity, is what was explained before because it's a life or death situation, they give up information that they know is vital to their own country. <coughs> media persuasion is just that. Um, the media persuading somebody to uh, 
I think, in a certain way. In the prisoners of war uh, scenario, media, it was not necessarily media persuasion, it was a persuasion of their captors. And raising internal conflict, uh, which is by sharpening the internal conflict between reason and emotion, the Inquisitor can bring victims to abject surrender. So by placing the victims or the prisoners in a tough situation that forced them to choose between life or death, they're obviously going to choose life and give up information that they know is vital to their own country. Uh, Harrigan argues that it worked then and it worked now. Uh, he noticed that uh, small groups seem to be more susceptible to brainwashing. So the prisoners of war um, in the post-war era were susceptible to brainwashing because they were in such small groups. And then he now notices that with the religious youth joining the religious cults that uh, Solomon highlighted earlier. He also outlines three basic steps of brainwashing similar to Solomon, which were isolation, persuasion, and coercion. On the other side, um, three scientists think that brainwashing is not possible. Richardson argues that there's a lack of scientific support to suggest brainwashing is possible. Richardson offered a counter to Solomon's paper and said that there are no scientific explanations as to why the youth joined the, joined the cult. He argues that in the first place, they clearly wanted to join the cult or else they would not have went out to seek the cult. And that because they're individuals, they can make their own decisions. Um, Anthony assesses the accusation made by the CIA against the communist governments, uh, or the, the, the communist governments were brainwashing their prisoners. Um, Anthony says there's a difference between persuasion and brainwashing, such as brainwashing is an actual act, persuasion is something that we are um, exposed to on a daily basis. However, the CIA was unsuccessful in their attempts to brainwash um, their own subjects. Because the CIA noticed or thought that uh, the communist governments were brainwashing people, they decided to try it out themselves, and they were unsuccessful, which is why Anthony thinks that brainwashing is not a real thing, because the CIA, which is one of the most respected branches of government in America, if they are unsuccessful, then it must not be a real thing. And then Taylor explains that brainwashing is simply a misused term. She explores many different brainwashing accusations in her work, such as education, uh, relationships, criminal justice. And she thinks that brainwashing is more of a word rather than an action, similar to uh, Anthony and also Richardson. Persuasion seems to be more of a logical explanation rather than brainwashing. All things considered, um, brainwashing is, has a very strong meaning in today's society because of what is going on with the religious groups. I don't think, I do think brainwashing is possible, but only in life and death situations. Because of life death situations, it's, you're forced to think one way or the other, and you're forced to save your own life. Or rather, 